Welcome to Bread and Roses. Hi everyone, I'm Aram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about the death of a famous Iranian labor rights activist, Mohammad Jarrahi. Interview this week is with Claire Klinenberg from Czech Skeptics on Paranormal Activity, and there's a lot of prizes there to be won. There's also an insane fatwa about uh, women cutting hairs and uh, also plucking their eyebrows, how that's on Islamic. And the slice of life is about Karar al-Asfur, an Iraqi atheist who has been released from detention in Greece. Stay with us. <music> Mohammad Jarrahi, a 59 year old well-known Iranian labor activist has died of cancer shortly after being released from an Iranian prison. He was released last year and uh, of course he had cancer while in prison. He had received no medical attention and you know a lot of activists said that who he was when he went in prison and who he came out uh, as was completely unrecognizable. Yeah, absolutely, and this is part and parcel of reality of life of the labor activists and opponents of the Islamic regime in Iran. Thousands of them are imprisoned, incarcerated, arrested, and actually the treatment they receive in Iranian prisons on the Islamic regime of Iran is unbearable and unheard of. Um, and most of them are kept in there to the point of if they can't actually kill them legally what they do they keep them to the point that actually get rid of them and if people need medical attention they're not going to get anything and that's that's the state of mm. uh, um, life of political prisoners in the islamic republic of mm. iran one of the labor activists that uh, uh, muhammad jarrah he was arrested with sharif saman he was killed in rajai shah prison and of course there are other uh, labor activists in prison uh, facing long-term imprisonment as well yeah, absolutely it's interesting how this compares with the attention that uh, international attention, for example, the American, um, you know, torture centers in Afghanistan, in uh, Thailand, and different countries actually receive the attention receives. Guardian recently did an expose that actually exposing how um, um, American torture system and waterboarding kill a lot of people who are arrested and detained by the. American CIA um, agents, and rightly so, condemned. But the same standard doesn't apply to the Islamic regime of Iran or similar regimes. So they actually are measured by different standards. Yeah, it's They're a always up to, yeah. also, isn't it? The racism of lower expectations and different standards for different regimes. What happens in the Iranian regime's prisons happens every day, all the time and yet you don't get the same yeah. sort of support. In fact, you have reporters in The Guardian, like David Chariot Mother, who actually support the Iranian yeah. regime and um, encourage it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, support. Um, uh, and always sort of, uh, apparently, the life in Iran is only uh, the um, divisions between reformists or the hardliners within the Islamic regime of Iran. The reality of life is that the Iran is a big prison and a lot of people are incarcerated on the harsh conditions and um, you know that that's life and I mean part of our responsibility is to expose the harsh treatment of political pr prisoners yeah, yeah. and labor I activists. mean especially when you see that the Iranian government has been part of the ILO committee the International Labor Organization committee for several years while it is a, a murderer of labor activists and it denies the right to organizing and so on and so forth. And of course, just recently Amnesty International has said that Iran is the number one executioner of child prisoners in the world. And here we have a regime that's doing this, uh, killing people, uh, or mistreating them, torturing them, day in and day out. It needs to be condemned. And of course, activists and political dissidents need to be supported in Iran.
Claire, it's a great pleasure to have you on our program. I wanted to speak to you about paranormal activity. What is that to begin with? So paranormal activity is defined as paranormal events or activities that are hi highly improbable according to current scientific findings. And why do we have so many people believing in this sort of activity? Because it's very easy to believe in. Um, science uh, is getting more and more complicated. The findings that we have go, are more and more distant from what people can understand. So it's much easier to believe a simplified version of saying, oh, it's a supernatural energy, than to actually take the time to understand what it is that's going on. You mentioned how some of it is dangerous as well. Why is that the case? Uh, it mainly applies to things that uh, affect human health. If you believe too much in the paranormal abilities of your neighbor, that they're going to cure you or cure, chi cure your child and you don't go to ha seek normal medical care, it can and it has many times resulted in death. What is uh, the most pr predominant sort of paranormal activity that you come face to face with? Mainly the healings. Um, you, that's kind of what people are most interested in. Uh, medicine today is very, very complicated. Uh, very, com it's not. There's so many different specialties, and uh, now, now newly, psychosomatic medicine is being explored, and just people are want to be healed immediately because our age is about everything being immediate, communication, everything, and some certain things that just take too long for them in regular medical places or hospitals, so they think that by waving a magic wand it will become healthy. So I think this is, it's kind of a supply and demand question. You mentioned a prize that you, you give, uh, your group gives for um, uh, if, if someone can actually prove that there, there is paranormal activity uh, taking place. Can you explain that? What exactly are you doing about that? So it's uh, very simple. If you can prove uh, your paranormal claim to be true, you will get 125,000 euro currently. But our prize is growing because anyone can kind of throw on to the pile. And it's interesting because we have donations both from rationalists who believe that there's no way this can be proven, and from people who believe in the paranormal and who want to support other paranormal believers. Uh, and the, it works so that first you have to pass a round of uh, probability of 1 to 1,000. And then if you pass that, you can go to the second round, which is 1 to 10,000. And if you pass that, you will get the money. It's very similar as the Randy concept was. So what is that exactly? Because this is going to be seen by people in Iran. It's going to be translated into Persian. So what is the ways in which you can refute this sort of activity? So. Uh, our challenge is unique that we let the uh, contestants or the p applicants design their own testing, which means they tell us exactly how their powers work, and we create the experiment to accommodate their powers as much as possible. For example, if you say that you can seek out live matter, um, and you can use it to help people who are in burning buildings because you're able to tell the firemen this the person is on the fifth floor, there's another person on the second floor, um, we do an experiment that we have boxes, we have mice in some, and we have rocks in others, and you have to be able to tell from, let's say, 30 boxes, at least 25 correctly, for it to be out of normal statistics, and out of normal prob probability, and then you can move on to the next stage of the testing. So you've never found one that's been successful? <laughs> no. We've worked on it for, so for five years now. This is our fifth year. Before Randy worked on it for 50 years. Before Houdini for three years. And they've been, there's been smaller challenges all over the world and no luck so far. Tell our audience about Houdini and Randy if they don't know who they are. Uh -huh. So Houdini was a very famous magician He uh, in the early 20th century. He was a famous escapologist. That means that he, his specialty was escaping from certain places like safes or, or handcuffs. And uh, he was also a fake medium. And he entertained a society by pretending to communicate with uh, the dead spirits. Uh, after his mom died, he decided to find a real medium, someone who could actually connect him with his mom. And he only found frauds. And he, that made him very angry. And so he started kind of doing a very big campaign against fraudulent mediums. Uh, and unfortunately, that only lasted for three years because he died from, uh, part of, as a part of his show. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. 
And then Randy, James Randy, he also started off as kind of the new Houdini. He also did uh, these kind of es escapes from handcuffs. And then he also turned the same leaf. He decided to look for people who claim that their magic was real, that, that what they were doing as a trick was actually real magic. Because um, as it says in his documentary and as he has repeated many times, he loves the art of magic. He loves the tricks and, and, the, and the thinking behind it, all the mechanisms. And if someone perverts it to say that what they're doing is actually real when it's the, the art, he takes it very personally. So that he, that's why he started a big campaign and he offered one million dollars to anyone who could prove a paranormal claim. This went on for 50 years. Over a thousand people applied and were tested and nothing. So, so what's some of the funniest uh, uh, things that you've come across in this work? So as I said today in our conference, telepathic orgasms. That is my all-time favorite so far. <laughs> so it was a lady who said that she can t uh, she can move from outside of her body with her mind and she can touch people and then she was uh, doing this with someone and they couldn't feel anything so she touched his head nothing so shoulder nothing so she did something else and that supposedly worked so <laughs> then she started like doing this more often and we were supposed to only touch test the touch, only the, uh, if, if she can touch someone who's in a different room. We weren't going to go all the way, but, um, but there are like all, many different kind of sex related uh, claims that we've come up, uh, uh, <laughs> that we have come across, like a lady who claimed to have supernatural erotic attract attractiveness to anyone. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, also it did, did not work out. <laughs> we couldn't test her because she, her, the, the way she said she wanted her experiment done, she said she wanted a group of only true saying men to rate naked women of how erotically er er attractive they found them, so, no. <laughs> As a final question, I mean, some people will ask, well, if it's not harmful, what's wrong with people believing in things like that? It, if, if they believe in it and they think it helps, what's wrong with that? It's because it can turn har harmful. That's the biggest issue. Uh, of course, we are not their parents. Uh, and they are not children. They are, people are adults. And, like the adults who believe in this. And it's their responsibility. But at the same time, if they are getting incorrect information from the media, then it is our kind of duty as as intellectuals of or or it's going to sound totally elitist, but you know people who study to, at universities or actually are in the position to know better. It's our it's kind of our duty to explain that to the people and to explain that um, okay, just because the government okayed a building uh, of a Chinese. A hospital next to our normal hospital that doesn't mean that it actually works and that's the biggest problem is when it gets kind of sanctioned by the government or by the media that people get confused and they think oh well if it's on TV it has to be true and that's kind of the biggest problem okay thank you very much thank you <laughs>
once we heard uh, lots of ex-Muslim organizations, Greek Atheist Association, local solidarity groups came together and intervened and he was released very quickly as a result. So it's That's just That's a beautiful great. moment yeah. actually that everybody came together and you could hear that in a voice of, you know, the telephone conversation you've had with him and the voice and people actually reacted very quickly. You know, international solidarity is, solidarity is still alive yeah. and it works. Together we can achieve a lot. Yeah, definitely. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this week's program. We'll see you again at the same time and same place next week. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo-breaking, free-thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.